within six hours of what I've described to you, the accident happened. And through the tunnel, over the spot where I'd seen what I'd seen, they brought the dead. I have not finished. I was last here. One morning, five months ago, as the day was breaking, I looked towards the tunnel. No, no, it was silent and did not wave an arm. It was leaning against a shaft of light with both hands covering the face. Oh, yes, li like this. Once more, I followed his action with my eyes. It was an action of mourning. I've seen such an attitude in stone figures, on tombs. He dropped his arms and went on quickly. I, I come in and sat down, feeling faint. That very day, as the train came out of the tunnel, I noticed at the carriage window, hands and heads, handkerchief fluttering. I saw just in time to signal the driver. He shut off, put his brake on. A woman was brought in here and put down on this floor between us. She'd been took ill in the train and died here. <laughs> now, sir, mark this and judge how my mind is troubled. A week ago, it came back. Ever since, off and on, it's been there. I hit the red light. I have no peace, no rest. It goes on calling for minutes at a time. Hello, below there, look out, look out, look out, look out, look out. It stands waving, it rings that bell. I caught at that. Just now, when twice you went to the door, had your bell rung then? It had. Now see how your imagination misleads you. My eyes were on that bell. And as I am a living man, it did not ring. At those times, he shook his head. I heard it. And when I went to the door and looked out, it was there. Both times. The wind and the wires took up the story with a long, lamenting wail. My mouth was very dry, as I said at last. Will you come to the door with me now and look? We went together to the door. Together we looked out into the night. There was the red danger light. There was the black mouth of the tunnel. There were the high wet stones of the cutting. There were the stars. He shook his head and spoke in a whisper. No. It's not there. We went in again. He closed the door. What does it mean, sir? What's the danger this time? There is danger up the line, hanging over some train that's due here, some worse accident. What can I do if I telegraph danger and give no reason for it? They would dismiss me. They would think I was mad. <laughs> well, I saw that for the poor man's sake, as well as for the public safety, what I had to do was to compose his mind. I explained to him that any man who thoroughly discharged his duty, as he did, must do well. He became calm. At two in the morning, I left him. Well, I had offered to stay the night, but he, he would not hear of it. I walked away along the double line of rails with a very disagreeable sensation of a train coming behind me. And I see no reason to conceal that as I ascended the path, I more than once looked back at the danger light and that I should have slept but poorly if my bed had been under it. How ought I to act? I resolved to return to him the next night, offer to accompany him to a wise medical practitioner and take his opinion. Next evening it was a lovely one and I, I walked out early to enjoy it. The sun was not yet quite down when I reached the top of the deep cutting. I would extend my walk for an hour and it would then be time to climb down to the signalman's box. Before pursuing my stroll, I stepped to the brink and I uh, looked down. <laughs> close to the red danger light, close to the black mouth of the tunnel, there stood a group of men. On the ground in front of the group, a tarpaulin covering a huddled shape. I descended the path with all the speed I could muster. Oh, what's the matter? One of the group knelt down and raised an end of the tarpaulin. The face of the dead signalman was quite composed. He has been run over by a train, sir. This morning, broad daylight, we're still waiting for him to come down for the... Well, as the engine come out of the tunnel, sir, that young fellow drove a Tom, tell the gentleman his companion step forward. 
I was coming round the curve in the tunnel when I seed him at the end with his back to me. No time to check speed. I blew the whistle. He didn't seem to take heed. We was running right on top of him. I shut off. He turned round and stared up at we run right on top of him. I looked from him to the dead face. But my natural shock at the sight of death was already giving way to a premonition of most unnatural news. And I looked from the dead face back to the driver of the train. But no man in his senses, said I, with a train bearing down upon him, will stay rooted to the spot. And then I asked him the one question to which I craved the answer, yet it was the answer which I dreaded to hear. What did you do, man, said I to the driver of the train? What did you do? to make this man lose all power of movement. What did you do to kill him? He gave the answer, and as he spoke the words, I felt the slow touch of a frozen finger down my spine. i done nothing, sir, I swear it. I just shut off and called to him as loud as I could call. Hey, what? Oh, I, I said, hello, below there, look out. I never left off calling to him. Then I had to cover my eyes. I couldn't help it. As he spoke, in shuddering retrospect, he drew his left sleeve over his face. But to the last, I tried to wave him away. <laughs> With the other hand, he made the motion he described, and in his attitude, I recognized too well the pose which the dead man had demonstrated to me. But, whispered the driver, it was no use. Overcome, he hid his face in both hands. It was an action of mourning. I have seen such an attitude in stone figures on tombs.